Chapter Twelve of The Clue by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve, Dorothy Burt. The people rose slowly from their chairs, and most of them looked as if they did not quite comprehend what it all meant. Among these was Carlton himself. He seemed oblivious to the fact that he was, at least tacitly, an accused man, and stood quietly, as if awaiting any further developments that might come. "'Look at Schuyler,' said Kitty French to Fessenden. The two had withdrawn to a quiet corner to discuss the affair, but Kitty was doing most of the talking, while Fessenden was quiet and seemed preoccupied. "'Of course, I suppose he must have killed Madeline,' went on Kitty. "'But it's so hard to believe it, after all. "'I've tried to think of a reason for it, and this is the only one I can think of. "'They quarreled yesterday afternoon, and he went away in a huff. "'I believe he came back last night to make it up with her, "'and then they quarreled again, and he stabbed her.' "'Fessenden looked at her thoughtfully.' "'I think that hunt man testified accurately,' he said. "'And if so, Carlton was in the house just fifteen minutes before he gave the alarm. "'Now, fifteen minutes is an awfully short time to quarrel with anybody so desperately that it leads to a murder.' "'That's true, but they both have very quick tempers. At least Madeline had. "'She didn't often do it but when she did fly into a fury, it was as quick as a flash. I've never seen Mr. Carlton angry, but I know he can be, for Matty told me so. Still, a quarter of an hour is too short a time for a fatal quarrel, I think. If Carlton killed her, he came here for that purpose, and it was done premeditatedly. Why do you say if he killed her? It's been proved she didn't kill herself. It's been proved that no one could enter the house without a latch key, and it's been proved that the deed was done in that one hour between half-past ten and half-past eleven. So it had to be Mr. Carlton. Miss French, you have a logical mind, and I think you'd make a clever little detective, but you have overlooked the possibility that she was killed by someone in the house. "'Some of us?' Kitty's look of amazement almost made Fessenden smile. "'Not you or Miss Gardner,' he said. "'But a burglar might have been concealed in the house.' "'I never thought of that!' exclaimed Kitty, her eyes opening wide at the thought. "'Why, he might have killed us all!' "'It isn't a very plausible theory,' said Fessenden unheeding the girl's remark. And yet I could think of nothing else. Every instinct of my mind denies Carlton's guilt. Why, he isn't that sort of a man. Perhaps he isn't as good as he looks, said Kitty, wagging her head wisely. I know a lot about him, and you know he wasn't a bit in love with Maddy. You hinted that before. And was he really a mere fortune hunter? I can't believe that of Carlton. I've known the man for years. He must have been, or why else did he marry her? He's in love with another girl. He is? Who? I don't know who, but Madeline hinted it to me only a few days ago. It made her miserable and that's why everybody thought she wrote that paper that said, I love S, but he does not love me. And you don't know who this rival is? No, but I know what she's like. She's the clinging rosebud effect. What do you mean? Just that. You know Madeline was a big, grand, splendid type, majestic and haughty and she thought Schuyler loved better some little timid girl who would sort of look up to him and need his protection. Fessenden looked steadily at Miss French. 
"'Are you imagining all this?' he said. "'Or is it true?' "'Both,' responded Kitty, with a charming little smile. "'Maddy just hinted it to me, and I guessed the rest. "'You know, I have detective instinct, too, as well as you.' "'You have, indeed.' and Rob gave an admiring glance to the pouting red lips and roguish eyes. "'But tell me more about it.' "'There isn't much to tell,' said Kitty, looking thoughtful. "'But there's a lot to deduce.' "'Well, tell me what there is to tell, and then we'll both deduce.' It pleased Kitty greatly to imagine she was really helping Fessenden, and she went glibly on, why, you see, Maddy was unhappy, we all know that, and it was for some reason connected with Schuyler. Yet they were to be married all the same. But sometimes Maddy had asked me, with such a wistful look, if I didn't think men preferred little kittenish girls to big proud ones like herself. And you, being a little kittenish girl, said yes? Don't be rude said Kitty, flashing a smile at him. I am kittenish in name only, and I am not little. You are, compared to Miss Van Norman's type. Oh, yes, she was like a beautiful Amazon. Well, she either had reason to think, or she imagined, that Schuyler pretended to love her and was really in love with some dear little clinging rosebud. Clinging rosebud! What an absurd expression! And yet, by Jove, it just fits her. And Miss Van Norman said to me, Oh, I say, Miss French, don't you know who the rosebud is? No, said Kitty, wondering at his sudden look of dismay. Well, I do. Oh, this is getting dreadful. Come outside with me. And let's look into this idea. I hope it's only an idea. Throwing a soft, fawn-colored cape around her, and drawing its pink-lined hood over her curly hair, Kitty went with Fessenden out on the lawn and down to the little arbor where they had sat before. "'Did you ever hear of Dorothy Burt?' he asked, almost in a whisper. "'No. Who is she?' "'Well, she's your clinging rosebud, I'm sure of it, and I'll tell you why. First, tell me who she is.' "'She's Mrs. Carlton's companion, Schuyler's mother, you know. She lives in the Carlton household, and she is the sweetest, prettiest, shyest little thing you ever saw. Clinging rosebud just fits her.' "'Indeed,' said Kitty who had suddenly lost interest in the conversation, and, indeed, few girls of Kitty's disposition would have enjoyed this enthusiastic eulogy of another. "'I don't admire that sort myself,' went on Rob, who was tactfully observant. "'I like a little more spirit and vivacity.' Kitty beamed once more. "'But she's a wonder of her own class.' I was there at dinner last night, you know, and I saw her for the first time, and though I thought nothing of it at the time, I can look back now and see that she adores Schuyler. Why, she scarcely took her eyes off him at dinner, and she ate next to nothing. Poor little girl, I believe she was awfully cut up at his approaching marriage. And what was Schuyler's attitude toward her? Kitty was interested enough now. Fessenden looked very grave and was silent for a time. "'It's a beastly thing to say,' he observed at last. "'But if Schuyler had been in love with that girl and wanted to conceal the fact, he couldn't have acted differently from the way he did act.' "'Was he kind to her?' "'Yes, kind, but with a restrained air as if he felt it his duty to show indifference toward her. "'Was she with you after dinner?' 
Fessenden thought. I went to my room early, and Mrs. Carleton had then already excused herself. Yes, I left Schuyler and Miss Burt in the drawing room, and later I saw them from my window, strolling through the rose garden. On his wedding eve, exclaimed Kitty, with a look akin to horror in her eyes. Yes, and I thought nothing of it, for I simply assumed that he was devoted to Miss Van Norman and was merely pleasant to his mother's companion. But, in view of something Miss Van Norman said to me yesterday, can it be it was only yesterday? The matter becomes serious. What did she say? It seems like betraying a confidence, and yet it isn't, for we must discover if it means anything. But she said to me, with real agitation, Do you know Dorothy Burt? At that time I hadn't met Miss Burt, and had never heard of her, so I said, No, who is she? Nobody, said Miss Van Norman, less than nobody. Never mention her to me again. Her voice, even more than her words, betokened grief and even anger, so of course the subject was dropped. But doesn't that prove her anxious about the girl, if not really jealous? Of course it does, said Kitty. I know that's the one that has been troubling Madeline. Oh, how dreadful it all is. And then, too, Fessenden said, still reminiscently, Miss Van Norman said she wanted to go away from Mapleton immediately after her wedding and never return here again. Did she say that? Then, of course, it was only so that Schuyler should never see the Burt girl again. Poor dear Maddy, she was so proud and so self-contained. But how she must have suffered! You see, she knew Schuyler admired her and respected her and all that, and she must have thought that, once removed from the presence of the Rosebud girl, he would forget her. "'But I can't understand old Schuyler marrying Miss Van Norman if he didn't truly love her. "'You know, Miss French, that man and I have been staunch friends for years, "'and though I rarely see him, I know his honorable nature, "'and I can't believe he would marry one woman while loving another.' "'He didn't,' said Kitty in a meaning voice that expressed far more than the word signified. Fessenden drew back in horror. "'Don't!' he cried. "'You can't mean that Schuyler put Miss Van Norman out of the way to clear the path for Miss Burt.' "'I don't mean anything,' said Kitty, rather contradictorily. "'But as I said, Matty was not killed by anyone inside the house. I'm sure of that. And no one from outside could get in, except Schuyler.' and he had a motive. Don't you always, in detective work, look for the motive? Yes, but this is too horrible. All murders are too horrible, but I tell you it must have been Schuyler. It couldn't have been Miss Burt. Don't be absurd. That little girl couldn't kill a fly. I'm sure. I wish you could see her, Miss French. Then you'd understand how her very contrast to Miss Van Norman's splendid beauty would fascinate Schuyler. And I know he was fascinated. I saw it in his repressed manner last evening, though I didn't realize it then as I do now. I have a theory, said Kitty slowly. You know, Mr. Carlton went away yesterday afternoon rather angry at Maddy. She had carried her flirtation with Tom a little too far, and Mr. Carlton resented it. I don't blame him, the very day before the wedding, but it was partly his fault, too. Well, suppose he went home, rather upset over the quarrel, and then seeing Miss Burt and her probably mild, angelic ways, I'm sure she has them, Suppose he wished he could be off with Maddy and marry Miss Burt instead. 
but he wouldn't kill his fiancée if he did think that. Wait a minute. Then suppose after the evening in the rose garden with the gentle, clinging little girl, he concluded he never could be happy with Maddy, and suppose he came at eleven o'clock, or whatever time it was, to tell her so, and to ask her to set him free. On the eve of the wedding day? With the house already in gala dress for the ceremony? Yes. Suppose the very nearness of the ceremony made it seem to him impossible to go through with it. Well? Well, and then suppose he did ask Madeline to free him, and suppose she refused. And she would refuse. I know her nature well enough to know she never would give him up to the other girl if she could help it. And then suppose, when she refused to free him, you know he has a fearfully quick temper, and that awful paper-cutter lay right there handy, suppose he stabbed her in a moment of desperate anger. "'I can't think it,' said Rob, after a pause. "'I've tried, and I can't. But suppose all you say is true as far as this. Suppose he asked her to free him because he loved another.' and suppose she was so grieved and mortified at this that in her own sudden fit of angry jealousy you know she had a quick temper also suppose she picked up the dagger and turned it upon herself as she had sometimes said she would do kitty listened attentively it might be so she said slowly you may be nearer the truth than i but I do believe that one of us must be right. Of course, this leaves the written paper out of the question entirely. "'That written paper hasn't been thoroughly explained yet,' exclaimed the young man. "'Now, look here, Miss French. I'm not going to wait to be officially employed on this case, though I am going to offer Carlton my legal services, but I mean to do a little investigating on my own account.' The sooner inquiries are made, the more information is usually obtained. Can you arrange that I shall have an interview with Miss Dupuy? I think I can, said Kitty. But if you let it appear that you're inquisitive, she won't tell you a thing. Suppose we just talk to her casually, you and I. I won't bother you. Indeed you won't. You'll be of first-class help. When can we see her? While they had been talking, other things had been happening in the drawing-room. The people who had been gathered there had all disappeared, and under the active superintendence of Miss Morton, the florist's men, who had put up the decorations, were now taking them away. The whole room was in confusion and Kitty and Mr. Fessenden were glad to escape to some more habitable place. "'Wait here,' said Kitty, as they passed through the hall, "'and I'll be back in a moment.' Kitty flew upstairs and soon returned, saying that Miss Dupuy would be glad to talk with them both in Madeline's sitting-room. End of chapter 12 Chapter Thirteen of The Clue by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen An Interview with Cicely. The sitting room was on the second floor, directly back of Madeline's bedroom, the bedroom being above the library. Miss Dupuy's own room was back of this and communicated with it. The sitting-room was a pleasant place, with large light windows and easy-chairs and couches. A large and well-filled desk seemed to prove the necessity of a social secretary, if Miss Van Norman cared to have any leisure hours. Surrounded by letters and papers, Cicely sat at the desk as they entered, but immediately rose to meet them. Kitty's tact in requesting the interview had apparently been successful, for Miss Dupuy was gracious and affable. 
but after some desultory conversation which amounted to nothing, Fessenden concluded a direct course would be better. "'Miss Dupuy,' he said, "'I'm a detective, at least in an amateur way.' Cicely gave a start, and a look of fear came into her eyes. "'I have the interests of Schuyler Carleton at heart,' the young man continued, "'and my efforts shall be primarily directed toward clearing him from any breath of suspicion that may seem to have fallen upon him.' "'Oh, thank you!' cried Cicely, clasping her hands and showing such genuine gratitude that Fessenden was startled by a new idea. "'I'm sure,' he said, "'that you'll give me any help in your power. As Miss Van Norman's private secretary, of course you know most of the details of her daily life.' "'Yes, but I don't see why I should tell everything to that Benson man.' "'You should tell him only such things as may have a bearing on this mystery that we are trying to clear up.' "'Then I know nothing to tell. I know nothing about the mystery.' "'No, Cicely,' said Kitty, in a soothing voice. "'Of course you know nothing definite. But if you could tell us some few things that may seem to you unimportant, we, that is, Mr. Fessenden, might find them of great help.' "'Well,' returned Cicely, slowly, you may ask questions if you choose, Mr. Fessenden, and I will answer or not, as I prefer. Thank you, Miss Dupuy. You may feel sure I will ask only the ones I consider necessary to the work I have undertaken. And, first of all, was Miss Van Norman in love with Carleton? She was indeed, desperately so. Yet she seemed greatly attached to her cousin, Mr. Willard. That was partly a cousinly affection, and partly a sort of coquetry to pique Mr. Carleton. And was Carleton devoted to her? Must I answer that? Cicely's eyes looked troubled. Yes, you must. Fessenden's voice was very gentle. Then he was not devoted to her. In fact, he loved another. Who is this other? Dorothy Burt, his mother's companion, who lives at the Carlton home. Did Miss Van Norman know this? Yes, she learned of it lately, and it broke her heart. That is why she was so uncertain and erratic in her moods. That is why she coquetted with Mr. Willard, to arouse Schuyler Carleton's jealousy. "'This throws a new light on it all,' said Fessenden gravely. "'And this Miss Burt, did she return Carleton's regard?' "'I don't know,' said Cicely, and her agitation seemed to increase, though she tried hard to conceal it. Of course, Miss Van Norman didn't speak openly of this matter, but I knew her so well that I easily divined from her moods and her actions that she knew she had a rival in Mr. Carleton's affections. Then he cared more for her in time past? Yes, until that girl came to live with his mother. She's a designing little thing, and she just twisted Mr. Carleton round her finger. "'Do you know her personally, Miss Dupuy?' A look of intense hatred came over Cicely's expressive face. "'No. I wouldn't meet her for anything. But I have seen her, and I know perfectly well that Mr. Carleton cares for her more than he did for Miss Van Norman.' "'Yet he was about to marry Miss Van Norman.' Yes, because they were engaged before he saw the Burt girl. Then, you see, he didn't think it honorable to refuse to marry her, and she— He had asked her then to give him back his freedom? Yes, he had, and Miss Van Norman very rightly refused to do so. Oh, Cicely, cried Kitty, 
do you know this or are you only surmising it i know it miss french in her sorrow over the matter miss van norman often confided in me as in a friend and you were a good friend to her i'm sure said fessenden heartily now miss dupuy do you think it could have been possible that Mr. Carleton came here late last night to ask Miss Van Norman once again to release him from the marriage? He might have done so, said Cicely in a noncommittal tone. He was very much annoyed at her behavior with Mr. Willard in the afternoon. But that was on purpose to annoy him? Yes, and it succeeded. How do you know all this? Miss Van Norman intimated as much just before dinner, when we were here alone. She feared Mr. Carlton was so angry he wouldn't come to dinner at all. And he didn't? No, he didn't. But, Miss Dupuy, it would scarcely be possible to think that if he did return later to ask his release, it would not be possible to think that, on Miss Van Norman's refusal to release him, he was so incensed against her that— Oh, no, no, cried Cicely. Of course he didn't kill her. Of course he didn't. She killed herself. I don't care what anyone says. I know she killed herself. If so, said Fessenden, we must prove it by keeping on with our investigations. And now, Miss Dupuy, will you tell me what was your errand when you returned to the library late last night, when the two doctors were alone there in charge of the room? I didn't, declared Cicely, her cheeks flaming and her blue eyes fairly glaring at her interrogator. Please stick to the truth, Miss Dupuy, said Fessenden coldly. If you don't, we can't credit any of your statements. You opened the door very softly, and were about to enter, when you spied the doctors and withdrew. "'I went to get that paper,' said Cicely, somewhat sulkily. "'Why did you want that?' "'Because it was mine. I had a right to it.' "'Then why didn't you go on in and get it?' The doctor's presence need have made no difference. I don't know why I didn't. I wish you'd stop asking questions. I will, in a moment. You are sure you wrote that paper yourself? Of course I am. The answer was snapped out pertly. And you wrote it meaning yourself? You didn't write it with the intent that it should be taken for Miss Van Norman's message? Cicely's eyes dropped involuntarily. Then she raised them and stared straight at Fessenden. "'What do you mean?' she asked haughtily. "'Just what I say. Was that written paper an expression of your own heart's secret?' It must have been because of Fessenden's magnetism or compelling sympathy, but for some reason Cicely took no offense at this and answered simply, Yes. Strange, mused Rob, how that man won so many women's hearts. No, it isn't strange, said Cicely, also in slow, thoughtful tones. And then, suddenly realizing the admission she had made, and seeing how she had revealed her own secret, she flew into a rage. "'What do you mean?' she cried. "'I didn't refer to Mr. Carleton.' "'Yes, you did,' said Fessenden, so quietly that again Cicely was silent, and Kitty sat surprised almost to breathlessness. "'There is to be only truth between us,' went on Rob. You did mean Mr. Carleton by the letter S. But have no fear, your secret shall be respected. Now we will have only the truth, remember that. So please tell me frankly at what time you saw Mr. Carleton come into the house last night. 
just a few moments before half past eleven cicely said this glibly as if reciting a carefully conned lesson wait a moment you forget that mr hunt fixed the time at quarter after eleven and that he saw you looking over the baluster at the same time with an agonized cry of dismay miss dupuy fainted into utter unconsciousness perplexed and baffled in his inquiries fessenden saw that for the moment miss dupuy's physical condition was of paramount importance and at kitty's request he rang for marie even before she came the others had placed cicely gently on a couch and when the maid arrived fessenden left the room knowing that the girl was properly cared for going downstairs again he was about to make his adieu to mrs markham and leave the house when kitty french coming down soon after him asked him to stay for a few minutes longer the sight of her pretty face drove more serious thoughts from his mind and he turned more than willing to follow where she led oh whistle and i'll come to you he whispered but kitty had weighty information to impart and was in no mood for trifling they found a quiet corner and then kitty told him that cicely had regained consciousness almost immediately but that just before she did so she cried out sharply they must not think schuyler did it they must not and so said kitty astutely you see it's as i told you mr carleton did kill maddy and cicely knows it but she doesn't want other people to find it out because she's in love with him herself rob fessenden gave his companion an admiring glance that's good reasoning and sound logic he said and i'd subscribe to it if it were anybody but old schuyler but i can't and won't believe that man guilty without further evidence than that of a fainting hysterical woman everybody seems to be in love with mr carleton said kitty demurely you're not are you said rob so quickly that kitty blushed no i'm not she declared he's a stunning-looking man and that superior impassive way of his catches some women but i don't care for it i prefer a more enthusiastic temperament like mine said rob casually have you a temperament said kitty saucily it isn't at all noticeable it will be after you know me better but miss french since you've raised this question of miss dupuy's evidence let me tell you what it means to me or rather what it seems to point to for it's all too vague for us to draw any real conclusions but as a first impression my suspicion turns toward miss dupuy herself rather than carleton cicely you don't mean she killed maddy oh how can you now don't fly into hysterics yourself wait a minute i haven't accused her at all but look at it miss van norman was certainly killed by carleton or by someone already in the house it has been proved that nobody outside could get in now if the criminal is someone in the house we must consider each one in turn and if by chance we consider Miss Dupuy first, we must admit a motive. What motive? Why, that of a jealous woman. Miss Van Norman was just about to marry the man Miss Dupuy is in love with. Perhaps, do have patience, I'm merely supposing, perhaps she has vainly urged Miss Van Norman to give him up, and, finding she wouldn't do so, at the last minute she prevented the marriage herself putting that paper on the table to make it appear a suicide this would explain her stealthy attempt to regain possession of the paper later 
Why should she want it? So that it couldn't be proved not to be in Miss Van Norman's writing. It's ingenious on your part, said Kitty slowly. But it can't be true. Cicely may be in love with Schuyler, but she wouldn't kill Maddy because of that. Who can tell what a hysterical, jealous woman will do? said Rob, with the air of an oracle. And moreover, to my mind, that explains her half-conscious exclamation of which you just told me. When she said, They must not think Schuyler did it, it meant that she knew he didn't do it, but she didn't want suspicion to rest on him. That's why she insists it was a suicide. So in earnest was Fessenden that Kitty felt almost convinced that there was something in his theory. "'But it can't be,' she said at last with an air of finality. "'It wouldn't be possible for Cicely to do such a thing. I know her too well.' "'Then, Miss French, if that, to you, is a logical argument, you must admit mine. It wouldn't be possible for Carlton to do such a thing.' I know him too well. Kitty had to smile at the imitation of the strong inflections she had used, and, too, she had to admit that one opinion was as permissible as the other. You see, went on Rob quietly, we're not really assuming Miss Dupuy's guilt. We're only seeing where these deductions lead us. Suppose, for the moment, that Miss Dupuy did, during that half hour in the library, have an altercation with Miss Van Norman, and just suppose, or imagine, if you prefer the word, that she turned the dagger upon her friend and employer. Wouldn't her subsequent acts have been just as they were? At Mr. Carlton's alarm she came downstairs, fully dressed. Later she tried to remove secretly that written paper. Always at serious questioning, she faints or flies into hysterics, and naturally, when suspicion comes near the man she cares for, she tries to turn it off. And then, too, Miss French, a very strong point against her is that she was the last one, so far as we know, to see Miss Van Norman alive. Of course, the murderer was the last one, but I mean of the witnesses, Miss Dupuy was the latest known to be with Miss Van Norman. Thus, her evidence cannot be corroborated, and it may or may not be true. If she is the guilty one, we cannot expect the truth from her, and so we must at least admit that there is room for investigation, if not suspicion. "'I suppose you are right,' said Kitty slowly. "'A man's mind is said to be more logical. "'A woman depends more on her intuition. "'Now my intuition tells me that Cicely Dupuy cannot be the guilty one.' "'At risk of tiresome repetition,' returned Fessenden, "'I must say again that that is no more convincing than my intuition that Carlton cannot be the guilty one.' Kitty's smile showed her quick appreciation of this point, and Rob went on, "'Though suspicion, so far, is cast in no other direction, it is only fair to consider all the others in the house. This will, of course, be done in due time. I approve of Mr. Benson, and I think, though his manners are pompous and at times egotistical, he has a good mind and a quick intelligence. He will do his part, I am sure, and then, if necessary, others will be brought into the case. But, as Carlton's friend, I shall devote all my energies to clearing him from what I know is an unjust suspicion. And then Rob Fessenden went away. Mrs. Markham asked him to remain to dinner, but he declined, preferring to go home with Carlton. He said he would return next morning, and said, too, 
that he meant to stay in Mapleton as long as he could be of any service to any of his friends. This decision was, of course, the result of his great friendship for Carlton and his general interest in the Van Norman case, but it was also partly brought about by the bewitching personality of Kitty French and the impression she had made on his not usually susceptible heart. And being master of his own time, Fessenden resolved to stay for a few days and observe developments along several lines. End of chapter 13Chapter Fourteen of The Clue by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourteen, The Carlton Household. Mrs. Carlton's dinner table that evening presented a very different atmosphere from the night before. The hostess herself was present only by a strong effort of will power. Mrs. Carleton had been greatly overcome by the shock of the dreadful news, and, aside from the sadness and horror of the tragedy, she was exceedingly disappointed at what seemed to her the ruin of her son's future. The Carletons were an old and aristocratic family, though by no means possessed of great fortune. The alliance, therefore, with the wealth of the Van Norman estate, and the power of the Van Norman name, seemed to Mrs. Carleton the crowning glory of her son's career, and she had been devoutly thankful when the wedding day was set. Though stubbornly unwilling to believe it, she had of late been forced to notice the growing attachment between Schuyler and her own companion, Miss Burt, and had it not been for the surety of the approaching wedding, she would have dismissed the girl but so certain was she that her son's ambitions, like her own, were centered on the Van Norman name, she could not believe that Schuyler would let himself become greatly interested in Dorothy Burt. But she did not allow for that mischievous imp of romance who plays havoc with hearts without saying, by your leave, and partly because of her own dainty charm Partly because of her contrast to Madeline's magnificence, Dorothy Burt crept into Schuyler Carleton's affections before either of them realized it, and when they did discover the surprising fact, it did not seem to dismay them as it should have done. But it troubled them, for Schuyler well knew that honor, expediency, and good judgment all held him bound to Miss Van Norman and Dorothy Burt knew it equally well. And, whether or not, with an ulterior motive, she had made no claim on him from the first. She had admitted her love for him, but in the same breath had avowed her appreciation of its hopelessness. Even if he hinted at a possible transfer of his allegiance, she had hushed him at once saying it was impossible for him to do otherwise than to be true to his trough, and that he must forget her, as she should, try to, forget him. This nobility on her part only made Carleton love her more, and though continuing to admire his beautiful fiancée, his real affection was all for little Dorothy. She came to dinner that night, soft and lovely in a simple white frock, her pathetic eyes wide open in grief and sorrow, her rosebud mouth drooping and tremulous at the corners. Fessenden watched her. Without appearing to do so, he noted every expression that flitted across her baby face, and he was greatly disturbed. The night before he had paid slight attention to her, to be sure, Miss Van Norman had spoken her name in the afternoon, but it had meant little to him, and, thinking of her merely as Mrs. Carleton's companion or secretary, he wasn't sure which, he had been conventionally polite and no more. But tonight she was a factor in the case and must be reckoned with. As Fessenden watched her, he saw, with a growing conviction, as sure as it was awful, 
that she was relieved at Miss Van Norman's death. Gentle, tender little girl as she seemed, it was nevertheless true that the removal of the obstacle between Carlton and herself gave her only joy. She tried to hide this. She cleverly simulated grief, horror, surprise, interest, all the emotions called forth by the conversation, which unavoidably pursued only one course. In fact, Miss Burt took her cue every time from Mrs. Carleton, and expressed opinions that invariably coincided with hers. It began to dawn upon Fessenden that the girl was unusually clever, the more so, he thought, that she was consciously concealing her cleverness by a cloak of demure innocence and careful unostentation. Never did she put herself forward. Never did she show undue interest in Schuyler personally. Fessenden reasoned that the game being now in her own hands, she could afford to stand back and await developments. Then came the next thought. How came the game so fortuitously into her own hands? Was it even indirectly due to her own instigation? Shuh, he thought to himself. I'm growing absurdly suspicious. I won't believe wrong of that girl until I have some scrap of a hint to base it on. And yet he knew in his own heart, if Dorothy Burt had wanted to connive in the slightest degree in the removal of her rival, she was quite capable of doing so, notwithstanding her very evident effect of pretty helplessness. When an excessively clever young woman assumes an utterly inefficient air, he thought, it must be for some undeclared purpose and he felt an absurd thrill of satisfaction that though kitty french was undeniably clever she put on no ingenue arts to hide it then kitty's phrase of a clinging rosebud came to his mind and he realized its exceeding aptness to describe dorothy burt her appealing eyes and wistful curved mouth were enough to lure a man who loved her to almost any deed of daring. "'Even murder?' flashed into his brain, and he recoiled at the thought. Old Schuyler might have been made to forget his fealty. He might have been unable to steel his heart against those subtle charms. He might have thrown to the winds his honor and his faith, but surely never— Never could he have committed that dreadful deed, even for the love of this angel-faced siren. Could she? The words fairly burned into Fessenden's brain. The sudden thought set his mind whirling. Could she? Why, no, of course not. Absurd. Yes, but could she? What? That child? That baby girl? Those tiny rose-leaf hands? Yes, but could she? No, said Fessenden angrily, and then realized that he had spoken aloud, and his hearers were looking at him with indulgent curiosity. Forgive me, he said, smiling as he looked at Mrs. Carleton. My fancy took a short but distant flight, and I had to speak to it sternly by way of reproof. "'I didn't know a lawyer could be fanciful,' said Mrs. Carleton. "'I thought that privilege was reserved for poets.' "'Thank you for a pretty compliment to our profession,' said Rob. "'We lawyers are too often accused of giving rein to our fancy, when we should be strapped to the saddle of the slow but sure truth. "'But can you arrive anywhere on such a prosaic steed?' asked Miss Burt, smiling at his words. "'Yes,' said Rob. "'We can arrive at facts.' What prompted him to speak so curtly, he didn't know, but his speech did not at all please Miss Burt. Her color flew to her cheeks, though she said nothing, and then, as Mrs. Carleton rose from the table, the two ladies smiled and withdrew, 
leaving Rob alone with his host. "'It's all right, old boy, of course,' said Carlton. "'But did you have any reason for flouting poor little Dorothy like that?' "'No, I didn't,' said Fessenden, honestly and apologetically. "'I spoke without thinking, and I'm sorry for it.' "'All right. It's nothing. "'Now, Rob, old fellow, you can't deceive me. I saw a curious expression in your eyes as you looked at Miss Burke tonight, and, well, there is no need of words between us, so I'll only tell you you're all wrong there. You look for hidden meanings and veiled allusions in everything that girl says, and there aren't any. She's as frank and open-natured as she can be, and, forgive me, but I want you to let her alone. Fessenden was astounded, first at Carlton's insight in discovering his thoughts, and second at Carlson's mistaken judgment of Miss Burt's nature. But he only said, "'All right, Schuyler, what you say goes. Would you rather not talk at all about the Van Norman affair?' Fessenden spoke thus casually, for he felt sure it would make it easier for Carlton than if he betrayed a deeper interest. "'Oh, I don't care. You know, of course, how deeply it affects me and my whole life. I know your sympathy and good fellowship. There's not much more to say, is there?' "'Why, yes, Carlton, there is. As your friend, and also in the interests of justice, I am more than anxious to discover the villain who did the horrid deed, and though the inquest people are doing all they can, I want to add my efforts to theirs, in hope of helping them, and you. Don't bother about me, Rob. I don't care if they never discover the culprit. Miss Van Norman is gone. It can't restore her to life if they do learn who killed her. Fessenden looked mystified. "'That's strange talk, Schuyler. But, of course, you're fearfully upset, and I suppose just at first it isn't surprising that you feel that way. But surely, as man to man now, you want to find and punish the wretch that put an end to that beautiful young life?' "'Yes, I suppose so.' Carlton spoke hesitatingly and drew his hand across his brow in the same dazed way he did when in the witness box. "'You're done up, old man, and I'm not going to bother you tonight. But I'm on the hunt, if you aren't, and I'm going ahead on a few little trails, hoping they'll lead to something of more importance. By the way, what were you doing in those few minutes last night between your entering the house and entering the library?' Carlton stared at his guest. "'I don't know what you mean,' he said. "'Yes, you do. You went in at 11.15, and you called for help at 11.30.' "'No, it didn't take as long as that.' Carlton's eyes had a faraway look, and Rob grasped his arm and shook him as he said, "'Drop it, man!' drop that half-dazed way of speaking tell me clearly what did you do in that short interval i refuse to state said carlton quietly but with a direct glance now that made fessenden cease his insistence very well he said it's of no consequence now tell me what were you doing last evening before you went over to the house at this Carlton showed a disposition to be both haughty and ironical. "'Am I being questioned?' he said. "'And by you? "'Well, before I went to Miss Van Norman's, "'I was walking in the rose garden with Miss Burt. "'You saw me from your window.' "'I did,' said Rob gravely. "'Were you with Miss Burt until the time of your going over to the Van Norman house?' "'No,' said Carlton, with sarcastic intonation. 
I said good night to Miss Burt about three quarters of an hour before I started to go over to Miss Van Norman's. Do you want to know what I did during that interval? Yes. I was in my own room, my den. I did what many a man does on the eve of his wedding. I burned up a few notes, perhaps a photograph or two, and one withered rosebud, a keepsake. Does this interest you? Not especially. But, Schuyler, do drop that resentful air. I'm not quizzing you, and if you don't want to talk about the subject at all, we won't. Very well, I don't. Very well, then. The two men rose, and as Carlton held out his hand, Rob grasped it and shook it heartily. Then they went to the drawing-room and rejoined the ladies. The Van Norman affair was not mentioned again that evening. All felt a certain oppression in the atmosphere, and all tried to dispel it, but it was not easy. Uninteresting topics of conversation were tossed from one to another, but each felt relieved when at last Mrs. Carleton rose to go upstairs and the evening was at an end. Fessenden went to his room, his brain a whirlwind of conflicting thoughts. He sat down by an open window and endeavored to classify them into some sort of order. First, he was annoyed at Carleton's inexplicable attitude. Granting he was in love with Miss Burt, he had no reason to act so unconcerned about the Van Norman tragedy. And yet Schuyler's was a peculiar nature, and doubtless all this strange behavior of his was merely the effort to hide his real sorrow. But again, if he were in love with Miss Burt, his sorrow for the loss of Madeline was for the loss of her fortune and not herself. This Fessenden refused to believe, but the more he refused to believe it, the more it came back to him. Then there was his new notion that came to him at dinner about Miss Burt. Carlton said she was the ingenuous, timid girl she looked, but Rob couldn't believe it. Executive ability showed in that determined little chin. Veiled cunning lurked in the shadows of those innocent eyes. And the girl had a motive. Surely she wanted her rival out of her way. Then she had said good night to Schuyler nearly an hour before he went over to Madeline's. Could she have... But nonsense. Even if she had been so inclined, how could she have entered the house? Ah, that settled it. She couldn't. And Fessenden was honestly glad of it. Honestly glad that he had proved to himself that Miss Burt, lovely, alluring little Dorothy Burt, was not the hardened criminal for whom he was looking. Then it came back to Schuyler. No, never Schuyler. But if not he, then who? And what was he doing in that incriminating interval? And why wouldn't he tell? And then, idly gazing from his window, Rob saw again two figures walking in the rose garden and they were the same two that he had seen there the evening before. Schuyler Carlton and Dorothy Burt were strolling. No, now they were standing, standing close to each other in earnest conversation. Rob was no eavesdropper, and of course he couldn't hear a word they said, but somehow he found it impossible to take his eyes from those two figures. Steadily they talked so engrossed in their conversation that they scarcely moved. Then Schuyler's arm went slowly round the girl's shoulders. Gently she drew away, and he did not then again offer a caress. Rob sat looking at them, saying frankly to himself that he was justified in doing so, since his motive effaced all consideration of puerile conventions. If that girl were really the designing young woman he took her to be, 
more if she could be the author directly or indirectly of that awful crime then fessenden vowed he would save schuyler from her fascinations at the risk of breaking their own lifelong friendship after further rapt and earnest conversation carleton took miss burt gently in his arms and kissed her lightly on the forehead then drawing her arm through his own they turned and walked slowly to the house a few moments later rob heard the girl's light footsteps as she came up to her room but carleton stayed down in the library until long after the rest of the household were sleeping End of chapter 14Chapter 15 of The Clue by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 Fessenden's Detective Work. Next morning, Rob went over to the Van Norman house with a clearly developed plan of action. He declared to himself that he would allow no circumstance to shake his faith in his friend that he would hold Carleton innocent of all wrongdoing in the affair, and that he would put all his ingenuity and cleverness to work to discover the criminal or any clue that might lead to such a discovery. Although some questions he had wished to ask Cicely Dupuy were yet unanswered, Fessenden had discovered several important facts, and, after being admitted to the house, he looked about him for a quiet spot to sit down and tabulate them in black and white. The florist's men were still in the drawing room, so he went into the library. Here he found only Mrs. Markham and Miss Morton, who were apparently discussing a question on which they held opposite opinions. "'Come in, Mr. Fessenden,' said Mrs. Markham, as he was about to withdraw. I should be glad of your advice. Ought I to give over the reins of government at once to Miss Morton? Why not? interrupted Miss Morton herself. The house is mine. Why should I not be mistress here? Fessenden repressed a smile. It seemed to him absurd that these two middle-aged women should discuss an issue of this sort with such precipitancy. "'It seems to me a matter of good taste,' he replied. "'The house, Miss Morton, is legally yours, but as its mistress I think you'd show a more gracious manner if you would wait for a time before making any changes in the domestic arrangements.' Apparently undesirous of pursuing the gracious course he recommended, Miss Morton rose abruptly and flounced out of the room. "'Now she's annoyed again,' observed Mrs. Markham placidly. "'The least little thing sets her off.' "'If not intrusive, Mrs. Markham, won't you tell me how it comes about that Miss Morton inherits this beautiful house? Is she a relative of the Van Normans?' "'Not a bit of it. She was Richard Van Norman's sweetheart years and years and years ago.' They had a falling out, and neither of them ever married. Of course, he didn't leave her any of his fortune. But only a short time ago, long after her uncle's death, Madeline found out about it from some old letters. She determined then to hunt up this Miss Morton, and she did so, and they had quite a correspondence. She came here for the wedding, and Madeline intended she should make a visit and intended to give her a present of money when she went away. In the meantime, Madeline had made her will, though I didn't know this until today, leaving the place and all her own money to Miss Morton. I'm not surprised at this, for Tom Willard has plenty, and as there was no other heir, I know Madeline felt that part of her uncle's fortune ought to be used to benefit the woman he had loved in his youth. "'That explains Miss Morton, then,' said Fessenden. "'But what a peculiar woman she is!' "'Yes, she is,' agreed Mrs. Markham, in her serene way. 
but I'm used to queer people. Richard Van Norman used to give way to the most violent bursts of temper I ever saw. Matty and Tom are just like him. They would both fly into furious rages, though I must say they didn't do it often, and never unless for some deep reason. And Mr. Carlton, has he a high temper? Mrs. Markham's brow clouded. I don't understand that man, she said slowly. I don't think he has a quick temper, but there's something deep about him that I can't make out. Oh, Mr. Fessenden, do you think he killed our Madeline? Do you? said Fessenden suddenly, looking straight at her. I do, she said, taken off her guard. That is, I couldn't believe it, only what else can I think? Mr. Carlton is a good man, but I know Maddy never killed herself, and I know the way this house is locked up every night. No burglar or evildoer could possibly get in. But the murderer may have been concealed in the house for hours beforehand. Nonsense! That would be impossible with a house so full of people and the wedding preparations going on and everything. Besides, Mr. Hunt would have heard any intruder prowling around, and then again, how could he have gone out? Everything was bolted on the inside, except the front door, and had he gone out that way, he must surely have been heard. Well reasoned, Mrs. Markham. I think with you we may dismiss the possibility of a burglar. The time was too short for anything except a definitely premeditated act. And yet I cannot believe the act was that of Schuyler Carleton. I know that man very well, and a truer, braver soul never existed. I know it, declared Mrs. Markham, but I think I'm justified in telling you this. Mr. Carleton didn't love Madeline, and he did love another girl. Madeline worshipped him, and I think he came last night to ask her to release him, and she refused, and then, and then... Something about Mrs. Markham's earnest face and sad, distressed voice affected Fessenden deeply, and he wondered if this theory she had so clearly, though hesitatingly, stated could be the true one. Might he, after all, be mistaken in his estimate of Schuyler Carleton? And might Mrs. Markham's suggestion have even a foundation of probability? They were both silent for a few minutes, and then Mr. Fessenden said, "'But you thought it was suicide at first. "'Indeed, I did. I looked at the paper through glasses that were dim with tears, and it looked to me like Madeline's writing. Of course, Miss Morton also thought it was, as she was only slightly familiar with Maddy's hand. But now that we know someone else wrote that message, of course we also know the dear girl did not bring about her own death. Mrs. Markham was called away on some household errands then, and Fessenden remained alone in the library trying to think of some clue that would point to someone other than Carlton. "'I'm sure that man is not a murderer,' he declared to himself. "'Carlton is peculiar, but he has a loyal, honest heart. And yet, if not, who can have done the deed? I can't seem to believe it really was either the Dupuis woman or the Burt girl. And I know it wasn't Schuyler.' There must have been some motive of which I know nothing, and perhaps I also know nothing of the murderer. It need not necessarily have been one of these people we have already questioned. His thoughts strayed to the underservants of the house, to common burglars, or to some powerful unknown villain. But always the thought returned that no one could have entered and left the house unobserved within that fatal hour. And then, to his intense satisfaction, Kitty French came into the room. 
"'Good morning, Rose of Dawn,' he said, looking at her bright face. "'Are you properly glad to see me?' "'Yes, kind sir,' she said, dropping a little curtsy and smiling in a most friendly way. "'Well, then, sit down here and let me talk to you, for my thoughts are running riot, and I'm sure you alone can help me straighten them out.' "'Of course I can.' I'm wonderful at that sort of thing. But first, I'll tell you about Miss Dupuy. She's awfully ill, I mean prostrated, you know, and she has a high fever, and sometimes she chatters rapidly, and then again she won't open her lips even if anyone speaks to her. We've had the doctor, and he says it's just overstrained nerves and a naturally nervous disposition. But, Mr. Fessenden, I think it's more than that. I think it's a guilty conscience. And yesterday, when I implied that Miss Dupuy might know more about it all than she admitted, you wouldn't listen to a word of it. Yes, I know it, but I've changed my mind. Oh, you have. Just for a change, I suppose. No said kitty more seriously but because i've heard a lot of cicely's ranting for that's what it is and while it's been only disconnected sentences and sudden exclamations yet it all points to a guilty knowledge of some sort which she's trying to conceal i don't say i suspect her mr fessenden but i do suspect that she knows a lot more important information than she's told "'Miss Dupuy's behavior has certainly invited criticism,' began Rob. But before he could go further, the French girl, Marie, appeared at the door and seemed about to enter. "'What is it, Marie?' said Kitty kindly. "'Are you looking for me?' "'Yes, mademoiselle,' said Marie. "'And I would speak with monsieur, too. I have that to say which is imperative.' Too long already have I kept the silence. I must speak at last. Have I permission? Certainly, said Fessenden, who saw that Marie was agitated but very much in earnest. Tell us what you have to say. Do not be afraid. I am afraid, said Marie, but I am afraid of one only. It is the Miss Morton, the stranger lady. "'Miss Morton,' said Kitty, in surprise. "'She won't hurt you. She has been very good to you.' "'Ah, yes, mademoiselle, but too good. Miss Morton has been too kind, too sweet to Marie. It is that which troubles me.' "'Well, out with it, Marie,' said Rob. "'Close that door, if you like, and then speak out, without any more beating around the bush.' "'No, monsieur, I will no longer beat the bush. I will now tell.' Marie carefully closed the door and then began her story. "'It was the night of the... of the horror. You remember, Miss French. We sat all in this very room, awaiting the coming of the great doctor, the Dr. Leonard.' "'Yes,' said Kitty, looking intently at the girl. Yes, I know most of you stayed here waiting, but I was not here. Dr. Hill sent Miss Gardner and me to our rooms. Yes, it is so. Well, we sat here, and Miss Morton rose with suddenness and left the room. I followed, partly that I thought she might need my services, and partly, I confess it, because I trusted her not at all and I wished to assure myself that all was well. I followed her, but secretly, and I... Shall I tell you what she did? Kitty hesitated. She was not sure she should listen to what was, after all, servant's gossip about a guest of the house. But Fessenden looked at it differently. He knew Marie had been the trusted personal maid of Miss Van Norman, and he deemed it right to hear the evidence that she was now anxious to give. 
"'Go on, Marie,' he said gravely. "'Be careful to tell it exactly as it happened, whatever it is.' "'Yes, monsieur. "'Well, then, I softly followed Miss Morton, "'because she did not go directly to her own room, "'but went to Miss Van Norman's sitting-room "'and stood before the desk of Miss Madeline. "'You are sure, Marie?' said Kitty, who couldn't help feeling it was dishonorable to listen to this. "'Please, Miss French, let her tell the story in her own way,' said Rob. "'It is perhaps of the utmost importance, and may lead to great results.' Then Marie went uninterruptedly on. "'She stood in front of the desk, monsieur. She searched eagerly for papers, reading and discarding several.' Then she found some, which she saw with satisfaction, and hastily concealed in her pocket. Miss Morton is a lady who yet has pockets in her gowns. With the papers in her pocket, then, Miss Morton looks about carefully, and, thinking herself unobserved, creeps, but stealthily, to her own room. There, monsieur, I was obliged to peep at the keyhole. There she lighted a fire in her grate, and burned those papers. With my eyes I saw her. Never would I have told, for it was not my affair, but that I fear for Miss Dupuy. It is in the air that she knows secrets concerning Miss Van Norman's death. Ah, if one would know secrets, one should question Miss Morton. "'This is a grave charge you bring against the lady, Marie,' said Fessenden. "'Yes, monsieur, but it is true.' "'I know it is true,' said Kitty. "'I have not mentioned it before, but I saw Miss Morton go to Madeline's room that night, and afterward go to her own room. I knew nothing, of course, of the papers, and so thought little of the whole incident.' but if she really took papers from Madeline's desk and burned them, it's indeed important. What could the papers have been? You know she inherited, began Fessenden. Oh, a will, cried Kitty. Marie, you may go now, Rob interrupted. You did right to tell us this, and rest assured you shall never be blamed for doing so. You will probably be questioned further, but for the present you may go. And thank you. Marie curtsied and went away. She's a good girl, said Kitty. I always liked her, and she must have heard, as I did, so much of Cicely's chatter that she feared some sort of suspicion would fall on Cicely, and she wanted to divert it toward Miss Morton instead. "'As usual, with your quick wits, you've gone right to the heart of her motive,' said Rob. "'But it may be more serious than you've yet thought of. Miss Morton inherits, you know.' "'Yes, now,' said Kitty significantly, "'since she burnt that other will.' "'What other will?' "'Oh, don't you see?' The will she burnt was a later one that didn't give her this house. She burnt it so the earlier one would stand. How do you know this? I don't know it, except by common sense. What else would she take from Maddy's desk and burn except a will? And, of course, a will not in her favor leaving the one that did bequeath the house to her to appear as the latest will. "'Does this line of argument take us any further?' said Rob, so seriously that Kitty began to think. "'You don't mean,' she whispered, "'that Miss Morton, in order to—' "'To receive her legacy.' "'Could—no, she couldn't. I wouldn't even think of it. But you thought of Miss Dupuy. Miss French, as I told you yesterday, we must think of every possible person, not every probable one. 
these suggestions are not suspicions and yet they harm no one who is innocent i suppose that is so well let us consider miss morton then but of course she didn't really kill maddy i trust not but i must say i could sooner believe it of a woman of her type than miss dupuis but cicely didn't either oh how can you say such dreadful things we won't say them any more they are dreadful but i thought you were going to help me in my detective work and you balk at every turn no i won't said kitty looking repentant i do want to help you and if you'll let me help i'll suspect everybody you want me to i want you to help me but this story of marie's is too big for me to handle by myself i must put that into mr benson's hands it is really more important than you can understand i suppose so said kitty so humbly that rob smiled at her and had great difficulty to refrain from kissing her end of chapter 15Chapter Sixteen of the Clue by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen, Searching for Clues. Believing that Marie's information about Miss Morton was of deep interest, Rob started off at once to confer with Coroner Benson about it. As he walked along, he discussed the affair with himself and was shocked to realize that for the third time he was suspecting a woman of the murder. "'But how can I help it?' he thought impatiently. "'The house was full of women, and not a man in it except the servants, and no breath of suspicion has blown their way. And if a woman did do it, that unpleasant Morton woman is by far the most likely suspect and if she was actuated by a desire to get her inheritance, why, there's the motive, and she surely had opportunity. It's a tangle, but we must find something soon to guide us. A murder like that can't have been done without leaving some trace somewhere of the criminal. And then Fessenden's thoughts drifted away to Kitty French and he was quite willing to turn the responsibility of his new information over to Mr. Benson. On his way to the coroner's office, he passed the Mapleton Inn. An impulse came to him to investigate Tom Willard's statements, and he turned back and entered the small hotel. He thought it wiser to be frank in the matter than to attempt to obtain underhand information. Asking to speak with the proprietor alone, he said plainly, "'I'm a detective from New York City, and my name is Fessenden. I'm interested in investigating the death of Miss Van Norman. I have no suspicions of anyone in particular, but I'm trying to collect a few absolute facts by way of making a beginning. I wish you, therefore, to consider this conversation confidential.' Mr. Taylor, the landlord of the inn, was flattered at being a party to a confidential conversation with a real detective, and willingly promised secrecy in the matter. "'Then,' went on Fessenden, "'will you tell me all you know of the movements of Mr. Willard last evening?' Mr. Taylor looked a bit disappointed at this request, for he foresaw that his story would be but brief. However, he elaborated the recital and spun it out as long as he possibly could. But after all his circumlocution, Fessenden found that the facts were given precisely as Willard had stated them himself. The bellboy who had carried up the suitcase was called in, and his story also agreed. "'Yes, sir,' said the boy. "'I took up his bag, and he give me a quarter, just like any nice gent would.' And then I come downstairs, and after a while the gent's bell rang, and I went up, and he wanted ice water. He was in his shirt-sleeves then, just getting ready for bed. 
so i took up the water and he said thank you real pleasant like and give me a dime he's a awful nice man he is he had his shoes off that time most ready for bed and that's all i know about it all this was nothing more nor less than fessenden had expected he had asked the questions merely for the satisfaction of having verbal corroboration of tom's own story with thanks to mr taylor and a more material token of appreciation to the boy he went away on reaching the coroner's office he was told that mr benson was not in fessenden was sorry for he wanted to discuss the morton episode with him he thought of going to lawyer peabody's who would know all about miss van norman's will but as he sauntered through one of the few streets the village possessed he was rather pleased than otherwise to see kitty french walking toward him she greeted him with apparent satisfaction and said chummily let's walk along together and talk it over immediately coroner and lawyer faded from rob's mind he willingly fell into step beside her and they walked along the street which soon merged itself into a pleasant country road fessenden told kitty of his conversation at the inn but she agreed that it was unimportant of course she said i suppose it was a good thing to have someone else say the same as tom said but as tom wasn't even in the house i don't see as he is in the mystery at all but there's no use of looking further for the criminal it was schuyler carleton just as sure as i stand here kitty very surely stood there they had paused beneath an old willow tree by the side of the road and kitty leaning against a rail fence looked like a very sweet and winsome portia determined to mete out justice though he was himself convinced that he was an unprejudiced seeker after truth at that moment robert fessenden found himself very much swayed by the opinions of the pretty impetuous girl who addressed him i believe i'm going to work all wrong he declared i can't help feeling sure that carleton didn't do it and so i'm trying to discover who did well why is that wrong demanded kitty wonderingly why i think a better way to do would be to assume if only for sake of argument as they say or rather for sake of a starting point to assume that you are right and that carleton is the evildoer though i swear i don't believe it kitty laughed outright you're a nice detective she said are you assuming that schuyler is the villain merely to be polite to me i am not indeed i feel very politely inclined toward you i'll admit but in this matter i'm very much in earnest and i believe by assuming that carleton is the man and then looking for proof of it we may run across clues that will lead us to the real villain kitty looked at him admiringly and for kitty french to look at any young man admiringly was apt to be a bit disturbing to the young man's peace of mind it proved so in this case and though fessenden whispered to his own heart that he would attend first to the vindication of his friend carleton his own heart whispered back that after that miss french must be considered and so said rob as they turned back homeward i'm going to work upon this line i'm going to look for clues real material tangible clues such as criminals invariably leave behind do cried kitty and i'll help you i know we can find something you see went on fessenden his enthusiasm kindling from hers the actual stage of the tragedy is so restricted whatever we find must be in the van norman house yes and probably in the library or the hall he supplemented what kind of a thing do you expect to find 
I don't know, I'm sure. In the Sherlock Holmes stories, it's usually cigar ashes or something like that. Oh, pshaw, I don't suppose we'll find anything. I think in detective stories, everything is found out by footprints. I never saw anything like the obliging way in which people make footprints for detectives. And how absurd it is, commented Rob. I don't believe footprints are ever made clearly enough to deduce the rest of the man from. Well, you see, in detective stories, there's always that light snow which had fallen late the night before. Yes, said Fessenden, laughing at her cleverness, and there's always some minor character who chances to time that snow exactly, and who knows when it began and when it stopped. Yes, and then the principal characters carefully plant their footsteps, going and returning, overlapping, you know, and so Mr. Smarty Cat Detective deduces the whole story. But we've no footprints to help us. No, we couldn't have in the house. But if it were Schuyler... Well, even if... He couldn't make footprints without that convenient light snow, and there isn't any. And besides, Schuyler didn't do it. No, I know he didn't. But you're going to assume that, you know, in order to detect the real criminal. Yes, I know I said so, but I don't believe that game will work after all. I don't believe you're much of a detective anyway said kitty so frankly that fessenden agreed i don't believe i am he said honestly with the time place and number of people so limited it ought to be easy to solve this mystery at once i think it's just those very conditions that make it so hard said kitty sighing and so completely under her spell was fessenden by this time that he emphatically agreed with her. When they reached the Van Norman house, they found it had assumed the hollow, breathless air that invades a house where death is present. All traces of decoration had been removed from the drawing-room, and it, like the library, had been restored to its usual immaculate order. The scent of flowers, however, was all through the atmosphere, and a feeling of oppression hovered about like a heavy cloud. Involuntarily, Kitty slipped her hand in Rob's as they entered. Fessenden, too, felt the gloom of the place, but he had made up his mind to do some practical work, and, detaining Harris, who had opened the door for them, he said at once, "'I want you to open the blinds for a time in all the rooms downstairs.' Miss French and I are about to make a search, and unless necessary, let no one interrupt us. Very good, sir, said the impassive Harris, who was becoming accustomed to sudden and unexpected orders. They had chosen their time well for the search, and were not interrupted. Most of the members of the household were in their own rooms, and there happened to be no callers who entered the house. Molly Gardner had gone away early that morning. She had declared that if she stayed longer she should be downright ill, and, after vainly trying to persuade Kitty to go with her, had returned alone to New York. Tom Willard and Lawyer Peabody were in Madeline's sitting room, going over the papers in her desk, in a general attempt to learn anything of her affairs that might be important to know. They had desired Miss Dupuy's presence and assistance, but that young woman refused to go to them, saying she was still too indisposed, and remained under care of Marie in her own room. Fessenden suggested that Kitty should make search in the library, while he did the same in the drawing-room, and that afterward they should change places. Kitty shivered a little as she went into the room that had been the scene of the tragedy, but she was really anxious to assist Fessenden, 
and also she wanted to do anything, however insignificant, that would help in the least toward avenging poor Maddy's death. And yet it was seemingly a hopeless task. Though she carefully and systematically scrutinized walls, rugs, and furniture, not a clue could she find. She was on her hands and knees under a table when Tom Willard came into the room. "'What are you doing?' he said, unable to repress a smile, as Kitty, with her curly hair a bit disheveled, came scrambling out. "'Hunting for clues,' she said briefly. "'There are no clues,' said Tom gravely. "'It's the most inexplicable affair all round.' "'Then you have no suspicion of anyone?' "'My dear Miss French,' said Tom, looking at her kindly, as one might at a child, but speaking decidedly, "'don't let the amusement of amateur detective work lead you into making unnecessary trouble for people. If detective work is to be done, leave it to experienced and professional hands.' A girl hunting for broken sleeve links or shreds of clothing is foolishly theatrical. Willard's grave but gentle voice made Kitty think that she and Fessenden were acting childishly, but after Tom, who had come on an errand, had left the room, Kitty confided to herself that she would rather act foolishly at Rob Fessenden's bidding than to follow the wise advice of any other man. This was saying a good deal, but as she said it only to herself, she felt sure her confidence would not be betrayed. Not half an hour had elapsed when Kitty appeared at the drawing-room door with a discontented face and said, "'There's positively nothing in the library that doesn't belong there. It has been thoroughly swept, and though there may have been many clues, They've all been swept and dusted away. "'Same here,' said Fessenden, dejectedly. "'However, let's change rooms so we can both feel sure.' Then Kitty searched the drawing-room and robbed the library, and they both scrutinized every inch of the hall. "'I didn't find so much as a thread,' said Kitty, as they sat down on a great carved seat in the hall to compare notes. "'I didn't either,' said Rob, with one insignificant exception. In the drawing-room I found this, but it doesn't mean anything." As he spoke he drew from his pocket a tiny globule of a silver color. "'What is it?' asked Kitty, taking it with her fingertips from the palm of his hand. It's a cashew. And what in the world is a cashew? What is it for? Why, it's a little confection filled with a sort of spice. Some men use them after smoking to eradicate the odor of tobacco. Eat them, do you mean? Are they good to eat? And impulsive Kitty was about to pop the tiny thing into her mouth when Rob caught her hand. Don't! he cried. That's my only clue after all this search, and it may be of importance. He rescued the cashew from Kitty's fingers, and then, slipping it into his pocket, he continued to hold the hand from which he had taken it. And then, somehow, detective work seemed for a moment to lose its intense interest, and Rob and Kitty talked of other things. Suddenly Kitty said, "'Tom Willard thinks we're foolish to hunt for clues.' "'I think he's right,' said Fessenden, smiling, "'since we didn't find anything.' "'Oh, he didn't exactly say you were foolish, but he said I was. He said it was silly for a girl to hunt around under tables and chairs.' "'He had no right to say so.' It isn't silly for you to do anything you want to do. But I know what Willard meant. He thinks, as lots of people do, that there's no sense in expecting to find material evidence of crime, or rather of the criminal, 
and I suppose he's right. Whoever murdered Miss Van Norman certainly left no tangible traces. But I'm glad we hunted for them, for now I feel certain there were none left. Otherwise, I should always have thought there might have been. "'How much more sensible you are than Mr. Willard,' said Kitty, with an admiring glance that went straight to the young man's heart and stayed there. "'And, too, you always make use of clues if you do find them. Look how cleverly you deduced about the soft and hard lead pencils.' "'Oh, that was nothing.' said Fessenden modestly, though her praise was ecstasy to his soul. "'Indeed, it was something. It was great work. And I truly believe you'll make as great a deduction from that little thing you found this morning. What do you call it?' "'A cashew.' "'Yes, a cashew. The whole discovery of the murderer may hinge on that tiny clue we found.' It may, but I can hardly hope so. I hope so, for I do want to prove to Tom Willard that our search for clues wasn't silly after all. And Fessenden's foolish heart was so joyed at Kitty's use of we and our that he cared not a rap for Willard's opinion of his detective methods. End of chapter 16